morning, everyone. Well, hope you are all doing fantastic this morning. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for what the Lord is doing this morning, what he's already done through worship. Uh, I was just on the verge of getting up and telling Kate and the team just to lead worship the rest of the morning. <laughs> it was so good. The Lord was moving. The Holy Spirit was speaking to me. I don't know if he was speaking to you, uh, but it was just very powerful to come together as a body of believers and worship together like that. Um, I know it's already was in the news video. Jamie mentioned it, but next Sunday, definitely come out for the worship night. They are powerful times where um, pretty much what happened here this morning where the Holy Spirit falls and we just kind of enter into this place with the Lord. Um, that happens on worship nights, and um, each, each time something different happens, the Lord speaks in different ways, and it's really powerful. So definitely encourage you, come on out. Um, but yeah, as Jamie said, Labor Day weekend, uh, lots of fun, lots of things that you guys probably have planned, things to do, um, and a fun little fact that I thought was kind of fun, not that it's necessarily meaning this, but in the United States, um, statistics show that on average, 10,000 babies are born a day, so tomorrow on Monday is actually going to be 10,000 people's actual Labor Day. <laughs> So, <laughs> I just thought that was a fun little, fun little fact there. <laughs> anyway, before I derail it any longer, um, yeah, I'm just so excited. Uh, during worship, the Lord is speaking many different things to me, and then even through this morning, there's kind of been this thread that the Lord's been speaking. And before I dive into my message, I just want to share it a little bit. Um, there's this uh, passage in 2 Corinthians that I read this morning, the Lord kind of showed me this uh, part of like becoming a new creation in Christ. And he highlighted this aspect of being in Christ, which is actually later in my notes. I'll hit on a little bit. Um, but I want to encourage us in that, that there's this place of being in Christ where uh, the things of life and all that kind of, when we're in Christ, when we're founded in him, when we're hidden in Christ, and not trying to do life independent from him, uh, there's something where things start to shift in our perspective, things start to shift, even in the physical uh, things happening around us. So I just want to encourage you in that, that as you go throughout this week, kind of uh, in your prayers and in your time with God, just kind of ask him, like, God, what does it look like for me to be founded in you? So I'm going to pray, kick us off, and then we're going to dive into today's message. So God, thank you so much just for everything that you've already done here this morning, God. Thank you for uh, just your voice to speak to us, your desire to be in relationship with us, and just your heart to encounter us where we're at, that you are a personal God, that you're not a distant Lord or a distant God, but you are personal, that you are a loving Father. And thank you for touching our hearts already this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that as we continue our time together this morning, that you would continue to speak, that you would... Uh, take from or add to anything prepared uh, to share this morning, that your heart would be shared, God. In Jesus' name, I pray that, that you would be with us, that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool. So the title of this morning's message, I was kind of back and forth, um, but I landed on, are you battle ready? And uh, it's just kind of sounded fun, because this morning we're going to be spending... Uh, majority of our time in Ephesians 6, uh, specifically verses 10 through 18. And this passage of scripture has commonly come to be known as the armor of God. And it's something that I've heard a bunch, and I'm sure a bunch of you have heard a bunch, and we have a good understanding, okay, like what it is. And a good, good amount of you may actually be able to quote them off the top of your head, like, oh yeah, it's this, 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 this. And that's good, but I want to dive into it this morning and maybe hit some different aspects of it that are oftentimes kind of looked over. Um, so probably for half of the time this morning, we're going to be spending in verses 10 through 13 before it even mentions the first piece of armor and kind of unpack what I believe is Paul's way of laying a foundation for applying the armor of God. So I'm going to read the chunk of scripture first just to kind of uh, get it out there so we kind of are all on the same page, and then we'll start diving in. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, 
um, says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep in prayer or keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So um, there is a lot that we can thank you. There's a lot that we can really dive into here. So um, we're just going to go kind of go verse by verse, 10 through 13, and kind of unpack what I believe is the foundation here. Um, so the first verse here, verse 10. Um, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And I love how the Amplified Version um, paints the picture of this verse. And we're actually going to be dipping into the Amplified Version quite a bit this morning because I feel like specifically in this portion of Scripture, it does a really good job at just kind of putting a magnifying glass on what these words mean in these passages and how to unpack that a little bit. So Amplified Version says it this way. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him, and be empowered through your union with him, and in the power of his boundless might. So the word here, to be strong, is actually translated more accurately to be, be strengthened. Um, so being strengthened by what means, and it says here, as it unpacks it, to be in Christ, all right? Be strengthened in Christ. It could have used the words by Christ or by God, um, but it would not have been the same implications. See, being strengthened by something is kind of like, all right, here, have it, it's yours, right? But being strengthened in something is kind of what I hit on earlier, is like being in Christ is how we are strengthened. Um, cool. So, only when our lives are positioned in the Lord, in union with him, do we possess the appropriate power to overcome the enemy. Jesus said, remain in me also as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself it remains in the, unless it remains in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 4 through 5. See, the believer's empowerment comes from being in Jesus. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And in Christ, we have at disposal the strength of the Lord. So this here passage, um, to me, kind of brings up this idea of being dependent on the Lord. To be in Christ, we have to fully depend on him. Because if there's any doubt that he is who he says he is, that he isn't going to do what he says he's going to do, um, it's going to hinder our ability to be in him because we aren't going to fully trust in someone that we have doubts about, right? So um, as we do that, it's going to kind of bring us into this place of like depending on the Lord. So uh, without a dependency on the Lord, we're not fully able to move forward in this passage. If we're not depending on the Lord, it's going to hinder our ability to accurately use the armor of God and to put on the armor of God. Um, there's one thing that us as humans, I know this because myself does this quite well, or tries to do this quite well on many occasions, is that when we are given a command, when we're given something to do or a request, we often, um, our fleshly nature tries to think of ways that we are able to accomplish that ourselves, right? Right? Um, 
You know, so I don't think it's much different here when we hear these passages like, oh, I'll put on the armor of God or stand firm or different things that we're going to be looking at. Um, it's so easy for us as humans to be like, oh, I got this, you know. Oh, I can, I can handle this one. And then only kind of reserve our dependency on the Lord for those specific areas of life where we get to the end of ourselves and we're like, oh, like, with this one, I need God. All right, let's, you know, fast. Let's do whatever, which is all good things. But here, true dependency is when you're having the best week of your life and you get a raise and everything's going great. You're nailing every communication with your spouse and all that, like, Dependency on the Lord is even in that week, getting before your knees and realizing that you are in desperate need of the Lord still, right? So that is what we're looking at when we're talking about this dependency on the Lord. And this is the foundation of everything else. If we don't grasp this, the armor of God is going to have a limited effect in our life. So, um, yeah, that's where we're coming out of. So moving on to verse 11, with that as the foundation planted, uh, verse 11 says, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version again. It says, put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armored soldier, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. So in a little bit, we're going to be looking at that armor of God, because here we see the first command of, or command of put on the armor of God in this passage, but um, we'll hit that later. For now, I kind of want to look at this idea of um, the second half of this passage, where it's talking about what we are fighting against, about, against the scheme of the enemy, against his deceit and his um, trickery, essentially. And I think... Uh, when hearing this passage, at least for myself when I was studying this, like as we read this, um, things might start running through your head, you know, a list of three, four, five, twelve, whatever things, where you start to think of like, okay, like it's pretty obvious some of the th- things of the enemy, some of the schemes, some of his deceits, right? Some are very obvious, but I want to challenge us today to also pay attention to the things that are not as obvious. There's a lot of things that are not as upfront, and those, to me, I believe are the more dangerous ones. Um, that as we get into the armor of God are going to be where we really have to focus and like put these things on. Um, Yeah, so I think uh, in this things, there's a lot of things that happen in life, right? As believers, we're signing up for, it's kind of like a marriage agreement when we come into relationship with the Lord is we're in it for better or for worse, right? And reality is, life is life. It's not uh, a perfect world. So we're going to have hardship. We're going to have um, things like struggles, hardships, disappointments, loss, and a whole other group of things. But these are not the things that define us. These are not the things that um, make us who we are, right? What actually kind of shapes us is how we respond in those moments and how we go through these hardships, how we go through these challenges, um, and how we can stand against these schemes of the enemy. So going back to my previous point on dependency of the Lord, um, it's how we rely on the Lord in these moments, ultimately. All right. So don't hear me wrong that in this, like, it's own, like it is only the dependency on the Lord when hardships come. But there's also value in uh, community. Like, the whole thing of the armor of God is, like, comparing us to, like, a Roman soldier, you know, putting on the armor. Roman soldiers did not fight alone. As we look later on with the shield and all, there's different techniques and stuff that they use that um, were most effective together. So I also want to challenge you that um, as you are facing hardships, trials, as you're facing things in life that just are not great, to strengthen yourself with those around you as well. Get like-hearted people pursuing the Lord, pursuing dependency on the Lord. And not that that's your primary help in those hardships, that the Lord takes first seat, but that you also have that community around you. There's so much value in that. Uh, Psalms 40, verse 1 through 2 says, 
Um, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. And this is like so forward, so straightforward, as clearly saying like the Lord is the one that pulls us out of all that muck and mire and sets our feet on the rock, sets our feet on that firm place to stand. So we can only stand against the enemy's schemes if we are allowing the Lord to be the one to pull us out of it. Um, so over my years, I've spent a lot of time in adventure sports, hiking, backpacking, rock climbing, all that, and have lots of stories and memories from that. But one that I remember pretty clearly that I think paints a picture of what this can look like. Uh, one time, me and my friends were doing a pretty, pretty serious hike, and there was one portion that was pretty steep, but it was like kind of wet and must have been raining or a spring or something that caused it to be more of like a mud slick than a trail, right? And when we got to this point, um, we could kind of make a little bit of ground, but we're sliding all over the place. And it wasn't until we started to use more of a teamwork effort where we help someone get to like a firm spot of the rock, you know, up however many feet. And then when they were firmly rooted in that spot, pulling each other up, and then doing this up through that spot that we were able to get through it in a pretty timely manner, right? Um, And it was only that person that got to the next point to reach down and pull us out of that slimy, muddy slope, you know, up to that firm foundation that we can then move forward. Um, And there's a lot of parallels to this, and you can really see the value in this. Uh, The same with the Lord, you know, pulling us up to that next place of firm foundation. And it wasn't that we couldn't have gotten through necessarily by ourselves, because there are things in life where we face, and if we wanted to kind of cut God out of the picture, there's ways that we could potentially, you know, get our way at least to where we would think is the next point. Um, But we would have gotten, if I would have tried that slope myself, I would have been covered in mud, probably would have had a few cuts, bleeding, a little beaten up and bruised, right? Or uh, on the contrary of that, I could have just went way out around and found a different route, but would have not stuck to the path intended for our journey for the day, right? So um, it's so valuable to not necessarily resort back to our fleshly desire, oh, I got this, I got this. That dependency on the Lord is necessary for us to succeed and most, I mean, most effectively, in a sense, get through life on the route that God's placed before us. So, uh, verse 11, right there. Stand against the schemes of the enemy, dependency on the Lord, pulling you out of the mire, so that he can be the one that stands you on firm ground that you can stand against, right? Against, all right. And then, what are we fighting against? Verse 12 Uh, Paul describes to the Ephesians kind of the nature of who we're fighting and kind of the nature of the fight. And um, again, in the Amplified, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, and against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness and the heavenly supernatural places. So we see quite clearly that we are not actually armoring up with physical armor. Um, If that's you, you're going to your closet every morning, putting on physical armor, it might actually hinder you, unless um, you're using like whatever that on armor stuff is, maybe keep using that armor if it's your deodorant choice. But uh, (laughs) um, but, yeah, as far as physical armor goes, it is not, um, not what this verse is talking about clearly, obviously, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but it's talking about a spiritual armor, because our battle is not physical. Um, we're not going to go out, and if we have like beef with someone, we're not going to go out and necessarily start a fight with them, or we shouldn't, because um, there's things going on in the spiritual realm. There's things, you know, there's schemes of the enemy that makes things happen in the physical. You know, there's um, repercussions, there's physical... Uh, examples of things that are happening in the spiritual realm, but ultimately our battle is spiritual. So um, we know going into the next few verses that when Paul's talking about these 
uh, things in the armor, it's about spiritual things. So it gives us keen insight into uh, how to translate what he is saying. So, yeah, what does it look like to fight the spiritual battle? All right, because it's kind of straightforward. The physical battle, you know, you do some sword fighting, you fist fight, maybe even do some jousting, something like that. <laughs> but um, the spiritual is a little harder to understand sometimes. And I feel like sometimes we don't hear it talked about a whole lot. But, um, yeah, it's good to understand. And I think that's why Paul brings it up, moving into the armor of God, because it's our everyday walk as Christians. You know, there's things happening in the spiritual realm, and we need to be knowledgeable about what's happening around us. So uh, how do we fight? We are, uh, first off, we are fighting for like righteousness, integrity, union with God, um, very much so our very own life. Like That's the things that we are fighting for and the value in fighting this battle. As Christians, like it or not, when we, I mean, as humans, as we signed up for this battle was on our birthday, right? When we were born, like, we're signed into this. And then as believers, uh, we kind of chose our side, right? So like it or not, we are all in this battle. We're all in the battle of life. We're all in this spiritual battle. And uh, it's up to us to see how equipped we allow ourselves to be in the Lord. So fighting spiritual battle, um, the large portion of how to fight this is found in the next few passages as we unpack the armor of God and what that looks like. But I also think a large part of this is kind of understand like who we're fighting kind of helps us know how to fight effectively. Uh, in combat, in military operations, they do a very large part of studying their foes, studying, and I'm not saying we go out and do a whole you know, Bible study on Satan or the enemy or anything like that, but there is a good understanding that we must have of how um, he likes to attack, how he likes to get in, because we're just completely oblivious and think that you know, we can withstand the fiery darts. We might not even know which direction to protect ourselves from, you know? So, um, first off, we see that they use schemes, strategies, lies, and tactics. They are not fair fighters, you know? They're shrewd, clever, and they don't fight fair at all. The, Satan um, is essentially opposite of Christ, who is true, just, upstanding. So Satan is not going to come normal t attack methods, right? And what's really, where this gets a little tricky is it's personal, right? Um, each one of us are going to experience attacks slightly different. Some are going to be uh, more prone to, like, thought temptation. Some are going to be more prone to physical temptation. Some are going to be, you know, like, certain things you can't um, fight better than others or whatever. The, Satan kind of studies us and kind of knows how to attack. So as we attack, we need to be strategic on where we're watching, what we're um, looking for in defense. All right. Cool, cool. Sorry, I just lost my spot here. Cool. So it's very important for us to just be on top of even what we allow um, ourselves to be influenced by, because a lot of times that's how Satan will sneak in, is through things that we allow, and he just kind of embeds things into. So we need to be intentional with that. So moving on, um, we'll look at the armor of God and really unpack that battle plan of how we fight this battle with that. But next thing we want to look at is this uh, almost like a second command. So the first command was to put on the armor of God. The next command is to stand firm. And we see that in verse 13. It says, Therefore put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis uh, demands, to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. So we see that Paul makes just a slight shift into this perspective of um, the fruits of and reasoning for putting on the armor of God. It's so that we are able to successfully stand and resist 
the attacks of the enemy. Um, and essentially what Paul is saying here is it's almost an equation where if we own the foundation of what we already looked at, if we're dependent on God, if we trust that standing firm is in that place of dependency on God, having him be the one that pulls us out of the muck and mire, on that foundation, if we can come in and put on the full armor of God that we're about to look at, there is almost, it's almost like a promise of God. If you, in right stand, or like in the proper manner and true faith, put this armor of God on, it equivalent, it's equivalent to standing firm successfully against evil and crisis. So, Without further ado, let's dive in to the practicals of the message this morning and how to apply the armor of God. How do we do this? What does it look like? Um, it's something we should be doing every day, so I think we should probably have a pretty clear understanding of what that actually looks like. So first armor piece that we look at here is the belt of truth. And when you think of a belt of truth, a lot of different things can go through your mind. Uh, most modern belts are about an inch and a half to two inches wide and holds up your pants, all right? But back when Paul was writing this, there's a completely different description of a belt because um, they didn't wear pants back there, so they didn't need that kind of belt. But rather, <laughs> what, what the um, belt represents in the Roman army and in the Roman um, armor is... It is kind of the core of everything. If you remove the belt from the armor, what happens is the breastplate is going to be flopping all over the place, and you're not going to have a place to hold your sword. You're not going to, you know, the only thing it might say is your helmet of salvation, right? Which is kind of cool. But, um, yeah, the belt of truth is what holds it together. Um, it was a large couple-inch strap and had armor that actually kind of dangled down to the knees to protect your front and uh, had a place for your sword, and just kind of held it all together. So that's the picture of the belt that Paul had in mind when he was talking about the belt of truth. Um, so what's really fascinating here is in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and it is only through him that we come to God. So it says that Jesus is the truth, right? Um, and all truth is found in him. So therefore, truth is the utmost important um, in the life of a Christian. Without truth, the rest of the armor is essentially ineffective. So John 17, 17 says, Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. So the word of God is truth. So we are actively supposed to lay hold of this truth, and use it, the, bait, or the belt of truth is a crucial piece of defense armor guarding your innermost being. The battle against the lies and deception of the enemy without understanding of truth, we are left vulnerable to the attacks of wavering doctrine, to lies, deception, and we are kind of left wide open to essentially believe whatever comes our way. The next person that walks by that seems like they have the right, you know, schooling, the right, um, you know, upfront beliefs, like, we'll just blindly follow them if we don't have truth, right? And that's what it um, talks about in uh, Ephesians 4, 14. It says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So even here in Ephesians, it says we don't want to be like that anymore. We want to build our truth. We want to build our understanding and wisdom in Christ and know the truth, know what he says, know what is like false, know what is true, and know um, how to believe. And honestly, this is something that is ongoing, something that we constantly are doing and should be doing. And even want to challenge you, um, you know, I'm up here preaching, Merle's up here David, whoever's up here preaching, you listen to the sermons. Don't just take everything that we say at face value. Like, this idea of truth is taking what you hear, applying it to the Bible, seeing where truth is. Because 
there's times I might misspeak. I'll be honest, like I'm human too, you know. Um, every pastor is subject to misspeaking here or there, and it's up to us as believers to, for ourselves, find what truth is. Because uh, truth is consistent, right? Truth is not different for each person. So the Lord kind of unpacks that for you as you're looking through Scripture, praying, talking to Him. He gives you revelation on things. So how do we lay hold of truth? What are the practicals here? And the answer is pretty much extremely easy, all right? Truth is found in the Word of God. Um, at very least, just spend time in here. The more you spend time in here, the more truth you will be filling yourself with, right? Uh, but more specifically, as you're reading through the Bible, um, ask the Lord to like unpack things, but read scriptures that are specifically like promises, things that the Lord has stated as truth. Read the, script, the scripture that speaks to specific areas, specific topics, specific outcomes that really builds up this foundation of truth. Um, so that's, that's really as easy as it is right there to get truth. Uh, Dove actually does have a great resource. It's a little booklet about this size called Who You Are in Christ. Uh, they're out there in the lobby. If you don't already have one, uh, go out there and check them out or find lists similar to it. But what it is, it's, it's a couple dozen references that just combats lies with truth, specifically in the area of your identity. Uh, your identity is one of the first and most common areas that the enemy is going to try and to attack, is come in and tell you, oh, you're either not this, what God says you are, or you are this, what God says you're not, right? So it's the area of identity where I think, I mean, we look for truth in all areas, but I would strongly encourage each of us to spend time learning what truth is about ourselves and what God says about us. So that resource is out there. It's called Who We Are in Christ, and um, I believe it's free. So uh, go grab one, take it with you. If it's not free, it's free this morning. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, my suggestion is to find something like that, find a list like that, and just read through it. Maybe even keep it on re like repeat, you know, as part of your reading plan so that we're filling ourselves with truth so that when lies come, you know, a red light goes off. Ah, this isn't truth. This is, you know, this is false. So that there, belt of truth. And then moving on, we got the breastplate of righteousness. The definition of righteousness is to walk in a fully justifiable or right manner. Another way of putting this is to walk blamelessly. Now, again, going back to my previous point, um, as humans, we instantly take this and we're like, oh, like, that's a hard task. I don't know if I can do that, like, but maybe I can. We try and do it. And that's actually a warning that that's where the religious spirit comes in a lot of times is things like the, around the topic of re righteousness, where we take things that are only possible in Christ, only possible through, you know, the gospel, through the salvation, and through the blood of Christ, and we kind of remove that aspect of it and try to make it on our own. That's where the religious spirit comes in and makes it more task-oriented, more like, I got to do A plus B to gain, you know, salvation, or whatever that looks like, or to gain uh, righteousness. That is not the case here, so warning, just don't get that mindset with righteousness when we're talking about this, but rather righteousness is um, more about placing ourselves in the blood of Christ, and what happens is when we are in Christ, when, you know, God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ on us. It's not necessarily seeing us and all of our mess-ups. Um, the command for righteousness is more of an intentionality to be Christ-like, to walk in a manner, not that we don't mess up. Like, obviously, our goal is not to mess up, not to have hiccups along the way. But when we do, I think righteousness comes down, or living in a manner of righteousness, is coming to that point of when we mess up, what is our response? How do we move forward? Do we repent right away? Do we ask the Lord for strength? Do we put up different structures or boundaries to help strengthen that area of our life? Or do we just, oh, you know, God forgive me, and then three weeks later do the same thing? I think righteousness is manner, or putting ourselves in this manner of growing and pursuing, you know, right living, pursuing to root out those things that are not of God. Matthew 6, 33 says, 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added onto you. So we make him and his ways our dwelling place, like Psalms 91.1 says. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadows of the Almighty. And then yet again, we need to delight in his commands and desires for his ways to become our ways. Psalms 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So when God um, is walking us through this, and that passage where it says to, you know, pursue the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. What that means is he will give you desires in your heart, right? Like it doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to pursue the Lord and I want a yacht, and he's going to give me that desire, right? Um, I don't know, maybe in some specific situations, God might bless you with a yacht, but <laughs> that's not what this passage means. What this means is as we are pursuing the Lord, uh, what's going to happen is our desires in our heart is going to shift and become in alignment with the desires that are on the Lord's heart. And that is kind of the process of becoming righteous, of becoming uh, people that are walking righteously, is that shifting that happens from uh, delighting ourselves in the Lord. So um, as we wear God's breastplate of righteousness, we begin to develop purity of heart that translates into action. Wearing the breastplate creates a lifestyle um, of practice where we believe in our hearts that God's word is true. That we believe in the hearts that it's, you know, when he says that it's worthy to pursue the things of him, that's where we start to shift. And I think that's what this looks like, is to position ourselves with that desire to be more righteous, more Christ-like. Psalm 23.3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So here, it's God's desire for us to walk this way. So if we ask, if we are faithful to pursue it, again, we're going to mess up. There's times where we're going to, you know, miss the mark. But it's not about that. Righteousness is not about how many times we don't mess up. It's about how many times we position ourselves in the Lord saying, God, I want to do better. I want to pursue you. All right, so breastplate of righteousness. Next, we have feet fitted with the gospel of peace. And this one, uh, there's a lot of different translations that word it slightly different, but it all kind of has the same core. And it's kind of interesting to think of shoes as part of armor, but it's also kind of weird to think about going to war without shoes, right? So it's a very valuable part, um, except for maybe the barefoot community. But... <laughs> um, now, all in all, this is actually a very, very valuable part of the armor. And if you actually do a little bit of looking into history here, I read that, um, hopefully it's true, but it seemed pretty reliable where I read it, um, that the shoes that the Roman soldiers actually wore were actually cleated with spikes or nails or however they could make it, which actually gave them an advantage for being able to stand firm in battle, Right? which is already a command of Paul, you know, stand firm, so that we can stand firm. So the shoes that we're looking at here are more of an offense weapon and a defense weapon. It's not just something to protect our toes in battle. Um, I also believe that it's kind of two-sided, the shoes of the gospel of peace. On one side, we have the confidence that comes from knowing the gospel, you know, as we understand what the gospel means for us as believers, as us, as children of God, there's a confidence that comes with that, and there's a peace that comes with that. If we know that without a doubt that we are children of God, that God has died for us, rose again to set us free, and that nothing in the physical or spiritual realm can take that from us, even in the midst of crazy chaos and battle, we can still have that peace and that confidence that comes from the gospel. So I believe that's part of what this is saying when it says be fitted with the gospel of peace. And then in some translations it says be fitted, let your feet be fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And I think this is the other side of that coin is that as we um, are fitting ourselves with this, we need to be ready at any moment to share the gospel because there's something that happens when we are um, 
sharing the gospel and like understand and pass it on where it kind of empowers us and kind of like encourages us to keep going. Uh, I can't fully explain it, but it's almost like we're doing as we're called to do as humans and created to do. And um, there's, yeah, just this like peace that builds up in us as we are sharing this. And other than that, I can't really explain even what's happening, but there's this peace that develops from sharing the gospel. So, um, cool, cool, cool. John 14, uh, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. So here we see that God's giving us peace. He gives it freely as a free gift, right? Um, and the contrast of peace is to not be troubled and to not be afraid. Um, as we are fitted with the gospel of peace, as we receive this peace from the Lord, um, what's going to happen is certain territories, certain things, certain hardships are not going to shift, but our perspective of those are going to shift. We're now going to see, um, you know, God's peace and grace through it. It doesn't make it easier necessarily, um, but if we were fitted with those cleated shoes, right, those cleated shoes, we were able to walk through those treacherous moments, walk through those trenches without fear of um, failure or falling because of the truth that the gospel is, right? Um, and also, going back to my story, I feel like if I would have had Roman cleats, I might have been able to get up that mountain a little better, right? Um, so, cool. So how do we practically do this? How do we put on the shoes of peace? Um, again, quite easily. And that's going to be the answer for a lot of these uh, armors of God things. It's, it's actually easier to do than we might think initially, because it's a big list. We're like, oh, like how do we do that daily? But it's actually quite easily, and they're all kind of linked together. Um, but... Really, it comes down to spending time studying the gospel message, you know? It says this peace comes rooted in the shoes of the gospel. So, understanding it. Um, I feel like a lot of us understand the gospel enough to receive it. and Understand the gospel enough to be like, oh yeah, like, I know, you know, Jesus died, rose again, and we have salvation. But there's like a depth to it that we only get through studying it for ourselves and reading the scripture and asking the Lord to unpack things. And, I mean, you could do that the rest of your life and constantly be getting a revelation of what the gospel actually is and what it means to us personally, what it means to the children of God, what it means to the lost. And it's just, it's crazy how, in a sense, complex it can be if we are dedicated to pursuing it. So I challenge you to do that. Take a personal, like, motivation for yourself to pursue understanding the gospel greater. One thing we can do to be ready to share the gospel, and I've heard of a few people that um, do this daily, but, you know, practice giving the gospel message, all right? What happens is speaking things kind of gets it into you. So in the car, in front of the mirror, whatever, like have like a five-minute gospel message that you can share. In one minute, come on message. And I know people that do this daily, where they're like constantly having the gospel on their lips daily, so that they can be at ready, you know, have the readiness of the gospel of peace. So I want to challenge you, if you've never done that, do it. Like, you know, walk through the gospel to yourself, you know, win your soul, no, your own soul, but um, no, it's, it's a really good practice to help us have that readiness of the shoes of peace. So, Cool. Uh, last verse for that topic is John sixteen thirty three. I have said these things to you that you may, or that you, so that, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. All right. So when we're, you know, at this place, we have the shoes on, we're going to move on to putting on the shield of faith. 
Sorry, I'm just checking where I'm at here. I'm going to move pretty quickly. Don't worry. Um, cool. So the shield of faith, I already talked about this a little bit, that um, Roman soldiers worked together. They were, you know, a whole unit. And their shields actually were about the size of a door, and they locked together. So um, this isn't my main point, but it is a good point that as we're walking through life together with people, there's actually strength in numbers when it comes to this. Um, and I think this even comes down to like confessing sins to one another uh, and receiving forgiveness and just kind of like doing life accountability, all that comes into this. Because what it says here is that with the sword or with the shield of faith, we can put out the fiery darts of the enemy, right? And with multiple people, you can then create like a all directional protection, right? It increases your ability to do that. Um, but that was just like a little side note there. So what is the shield of faith? Uh, first off, faith. What's faith? All right. Um, some aspects of faith is believing in the Lord, you know, and receiving salvation. Some people call that faith, which it is. Like our work with the Lord is faith. But faith itself, uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance title, deed, or confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality, faith comprehends as fact that cannot be experienced by the physical sense. So here we see that faith is the confidence in the promises of the Lord and the hope in the promises of the Lord. Um, so uh, what this means is, again, as you read through Scripture, there's promises of the Lord, like, I will not leave you nor forsake you, right? Faith is taking that promise and having a hope that says, you know what, that's true, and I'm going to hold on to that, and my actions are going to reflect that belief. So that is what faith is. When it says to take up the shield of faith, what we're actually doing is taking the words of the Lord, things that he's promised, things that are guaranteed to us, and yielding them in a sense of saying, no, God said this, so this lie, this dart, this fiery dart cannot touch me because of this truth. Um, that is what faith looks like in this context here. Hebrews eleven six says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here it says, that we need to draw near to God, and we must believe that, first off, he exists, foundation, but then that he rewards those who seek him, that as we seek him, those things that he loves to give us, those things that he says he'll give us, that he'll give us, our belief in that is what faith looks like. So it's taking up the shield is not a circumstantial thing. It's not looking at the circumstances and choosing that day. If we believe that God's promises is true, it's proactively taking it up, and no matter what circumstances hit us, we know that his truth is still truth. Romans ten seventeen says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Um, so practically, how we put this on, again, comes back to the word. Um, I feel like this morning's message could be called, Read Your Bible. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's true. As we get the word in us, you know, this is packed full of promises, packed full of truth, packed full of things that God says that he does, will do, and won't do, you know. It says, has all this in there that we can use as our foundation for our faith. As a matter of fact, we need to use for a foundation of faith, because if we have faith in just things that we think up, that's going to fall, but it has to be rooted in truth in God. So, um, Cool. Moving on to helmet of salvation. I think that it's um, strategic that Paul uses the helmet for this one because uh, um, so often, as I already alluded to earlier, that Satan attacks our minds. You know, That is usually where he's going to attack first is try to get into our thoughts, try to plant little doubts, little lies, little deceptions. You know, He's going to say, oh, you're not really this or you did this, so, you know, you're not worthy. And a lot of times this takes root in past stuff, you know. 
he'll try to bring back past temptations. He's trying to bring back past failures or past hurts that you might have already walked through with the Lord, got healing from, got deliverance from, got forgiveness from. But again, he doesn't play fair. So he's going to be bringing those and is putting on that helmet of salvation saying, no, I am in Christ. I died to my old self. I am a new creation. And that is what the helmet of salvation looks like, is to renew our minds. It's speaking specifically to how we take thoughts captive, as it says in um, 2 Corinthians 10. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So as we put on the helmet of salvation, it's important to pay attention to where our thoughts go, what they're doing. Um, it's more of a... Um, what it does is it gives us an awareness of where our thoughts are at, and we just don't blindly think every thought that we runs through our head is our own personal thought. It's taking those that we know are not, know those lies, know that he's such, and be like, nope, that's not it, and bringing them under the truth of the Lord. So that is what the helmet of salvation looks like. And then finally, the last piece of armor um, is the sword of the Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is probably the most straightforward one out of the entire list of the armor. And that is because it tells us right in the passage that is the word of the Lord. It's the Bible, right? So um, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So um, the two-edged sword, the sword of the spirit, is intentionally designed, you know, two-sided for penetration, you know. That's why the Romans created a double-edged sword. It penetrates and slices multiple directions. It's very effective for going deep, which represents that the word of the Lord, the sword of the spirit, it actually penetrates deep into our hearts is the intent of it, right? It goes into the hearts of others as we share it, that it digs deep. It's not just surfacey stuff. And that's not on our own will. It's not like the harder we shove it, the deeper it goes. It's the Lord, you know, it's the sword of the Spirit. So as we yield the sword of the Spirit, it's the Spirit that does the work. It's not us. It's, uh, it's not excellent craftsmanship of, like, sword fighting that gets us places. It's allowing the Holy Spirit um, to work through it. And I believe what this looks like um, is found, let me see here. Sorry. Jump in my notes here a little bit. Um, in John 14, 26, as we get the word in us, as we read the word, as we fill ourselves with um, biblical truth, what's going to happen, and a lot of times this might even be the hiccup for some people, is, oh, I'll read it, you know, I read all these passages, and then I can remember, like, 2% of it, right? But what happens is as we get the Scripture in us, John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. So what it looks like to take up the sword of the Spirit is to fill ourselves with the Word of God so that in battle, when different crises rise, the Holy Spirit then draws out the things that are already in you and brings it to remembrance and says, oh, this lie that you've never had to deal with before that's fresh for this crisis or this season, you read this scripture that's going to combat that. And that's what it looks like to yield the sword of the Spirit. So worship team, you guys can come up, and I'll start wrapping up here. Um, so, cool. So then we see there's one more verse left in the passage that we're looking at here, um, verse 18, and it kind of already wrapped up what the armor of God is, but then it kind of goes into this like little capstone, like tagged on sentence that, again, we've heard many times before, but probably not in the same context um, as with the armor of God. We've heard it in a lot of messages about prayer and stuff like that, but it's actually part of this uh, segment of scripture. And it says, with all prayer and petition, or, or petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion, and in every season. And the spirit 
And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. So this passage um, kind of goes from all of this armor of God that realistically all of it is rooted in the word. All of it is different aspects of the word. Like, hey, be essentially the armor of God is saying, hey, be studious of the Bible. Know this aspect, know this aspect, have this aspect in your heart, have this aspect in your heart. Read, like regularly be in the word. And then it says, but also be in prayer, be in communion with God, be in conversation with God constantly. It says in all occasions, in all seasons, again, going back to that best week ever of your life, it's in those moments, but it's also in the greatest pain seasons as well of your life. If you can maintain a constant relationship with the Lord where prayer is priority, where you are talking to the Lord day in, day out, bringing him the joys, bringing him the hardships, that is um, kind of the capstone to the armor of God. You see, we start with dependency on the Lord. We put on the armor of God, and then we're in prayer, you see. So, um, yeah, I strongly believe that... Paul kind of leaves this out of the armor of God. Like he could have attached this to something else, like the satchel of whatever. But um, I believe he left it out because it's like encompassing all of it, like in that like prayer. Like as we're praying, as we're reading, the Lord will guide us in our reading. As we're praying, as we're, you know, in hardships, that's as the Lord draws scripture to remembrance, all that. Um, I believe that. The prayer is constant in all seasons, you know? Um, cool. So in closing, uh, I'm going to have a few questions here. And it's kind of more of like a self-reflection time, so it's not necessarily a ministry time where um, we'll have, you know, a bunch of people getting prayer and stuff. If you do feel like you need prayer for anything, there will be prayer ministers up front, uh, and they'll pray for you for anything you need. But the questions that we'll have up on the screen... Um, is kind of like more prompting questions for you to kind of dig deep. Like, all right, Lord, like assess me. And let me know uh, where I stand with some of this. So the first question is, where is my level of dependency on the Lord? Like, where do you fall on that line of, all right, is it just the hard, you know, weeks of the year that I depend on the Lord? Or is it constantly? Is it daily? Am I picking up that dependency on the Lord the moment I wake up, you know? Am I relying on him for the energy and the strategies for each day? So kind of assess where, where is that? Where are your level of dependency on the Lord and where can you grow in it? Second question is, am I actively wearing the armor of God daily? Um, ask the Lord of any area you can grow in. Is there an area that you're not as um, strong in when you're wearing, you know, are you missing the belt of truth? Are you missing the shoes of the gospel of peace? Kind of ask the Lord to reveal some of that to you. And then thirdly, what will you do differently this week in the area of putting on the armor of God? Is there ways that you can view it differently? Is there ways that um, you can do it more? Whatever that looks like. So I'm going to pray. Uh, close this out here. We'll do one song. Um, and then um, just to give people time if you need prayer grab some around you. I believe there will be prayer ministers up front. Um, but spend some time asking the Lord, all right, where, where, how can I grow in this? How can I grow th um, with this knowledge and wisdom of the armor of God? So God, thank you so much that you equip us. Thank you so much that it's you that we can depend on, that it's not on our own strength, that you don't give us this um, command to put on the armor of God so that we can go out solo and try and fight our own battles, God, but you fight our battles. That this command of putting on the armor of God is an invitation to step into you, to be in Christ. That this is an invitation to walk hand in hand with you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, encourage us. I pray that um, any areas that we have been lacking in this, uh, maybe we don't even actively put on any of the armor of God unless we're, you know, in the midst of a tough battle, that you would, uh, yeah, that you would 
just come and softly convict us and grow us in that. I pray that we would have peace in this, God, that there would, that any lies surrounding this, that even now I feel like the enemy is coming in and saying, oh, you haven't done that. Oh, you're not doing that well, so, you know, you're missing out on this. I pray that those lies would just be counteracted with truth right now, that you take us where we're at and you pull us out of the muck and mire, that you set our feet on the firm rock. So God, I pray that this week that we would be able to put this into action and that we would not get discouraged if we mess up or fall short or, you know, don't actively do these things on a given day, but that we would be encouraged to even have the invitation to walk with you in this way. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching this teaching. I hope that it impacted you in some way. If you enjoyed this teaching and would like more teachings like this, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get updated each time we post a new sermon.